This morning, I want to spend a few minutes together talking about legacy living. And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture from Luke chapter 14. So if you have your Bible with you or you use a, a digital device, whatever you use, open it to Luke chapter 14. And we're going to look together at Luke chapter 14 together this morning. Usually when we talk about legacy living, we think about some time in the future. When we think about leaving a legacy, we think that's something that we do later on. That's something that happens when we leave this life. But the reality is le legacy living or leaving a legacy starts today. We make intentional choices today to ensure the kingdom of God expands in the future. Now, several years ago, I came across a quote by Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a, a pastor. He pastored the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London for about 38 years in the mid-1800s. And this is what Charles Spurgeon said. It's a simple sentence. Let me read it to you. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Let that sink in for a minute. Every Christian, so if you're a follower of Jesus today, this includes you, every follower of Jesus is either a missionary or an imposter. That quote has sort of got my attention for many, many years. See, all of us are to live as missionaries today. All of us are to live today pointing people to Jesus, expanding God's kingdom. As Charles Spurgeon said, you're either, mission, you're either a missionary or you're an imposter. So this morning as we examine Luke chapter 14, I want to give you three truths out of Luke, practice, Luke chapter 14. Three truths that help us practice legacy living. Or as Charles Spurgeon would say, living as missionaries in this life. Because if you're not living as a missionary every day for Jesus, then you're living as an imposter. Now I know we've had several years of craziness, about two and a half years of just pure craziness, I call it. I mean, uh, we, we've had sickness, we've had this pandemic um, that, that none of us expected. Our, our culture, our society, our, our, our nation, even the world has not known how to navigate through this. Um, we've had, you know, do this and you won't get it. And then our president gets it multiple times. And, and we've had racial divide, political divide. Uh, we're in the midst of, a, we're not in the midst of, but there's a war going on in Europe right now, significant war. And then on the home front, now we have record inflation. As of the end of June, the inflation the United, level in the United States was 9.1%. It was like 6% in December, now at 9.1%. We live in some very, very unique times. But, and it feels like it's, it's getting harder and harder to be a missionary, to be a follower of Christ, to stand for truth. But here's what I see as the good news. The cultural, moral, political shifts that we're seeing in our society, they are requiring us to be either stronger and bolder in legacy living, or they're forcing us to back down and hide from our faith. And here's why I see that as a good thing. Because it's, it's really forcing us to choose legacy living. It's forcing us to stand up for what we believe. We don't throw in the towel. We're not content living, as Charles Spurgeon would say, as an imposter. We want to be faithful followers of Jesus, pointing other people to Him. I don't want to give up. I don't believe you want to give up. Now, the tension that we're facing in our society right now, in our culture, is nothing new. I mean, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. If you read the New Testament, you'll find some of the same tension that we find in our culture today. You'll find it among the first New Testament believers in the first New Testament church. Yes, times have changed. The world's different. We have the internet and a whole lot of things they didn't have in the first New Testament church. But legacy living has always been difficult. Legacy living has always required a significant level of commitment. For the New Testament believers, they sacrificed everything. They gave up everything to follow Jesus. And what's required of us today is to give up everything 
to follow Jesus. Let's read our text this morning. Let me read from you, or let me read for you from Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. It says, Great crowds were following Jesus. And he turned around to the crowds and said to them, If you want to be my follower, let me give you a little commentary here. What Jesus was talking about was legacy living. If you want to live as an authentic follower of Jesus Christ, as my missionary and not as an imposter. So Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if there is enough money to pay the bills? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of funds. And then how everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and ran out of money before it was finished. Or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough to defeat the 20,000 soldiers who are marching against them. If he's not able, then while the enemy is still far away, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace. And then verse 33. So no one can become my disciple without giving up everything for me. Now there's a lot there in those verses. Legacy living is not heroic Christianity. Living as a missionary for Christ is not heroic Christianity. It's Christianity 101. Inviting your neighbor, your co-worker, your friend, a relative to church isn't heroic or extraordinary. It's the basics. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Serving Jesus with all that we have and all that we are and everything God has entrusted to us it's is what's required of every Christ follower. Just read Acts 1, chapter, Acts 1 verse 8. Jesus said this. He said, tell people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You see, Christ has called every single one of us to be His missionaries in the world in which we live. That means in your own home. That means in your neighborhood. That means at your workplace, at your school, the gym, uh, in the sports that your, your kids do. That's your Jerusalem. It includes being a missionary outside of your own community in Judea and Samaria. That's why people tell Jesus, that's why we plant churches and tell people about Jesus in every community across our nation. Legacy living also includes taking the gospel to places around the globe where people have not heard the good news of Jesus. So here's what I want, to, what I want us to spend a few minutes discussing. What does it take for you and for me to personally practice legacy living? How do I make sure I move from living as an imposter to living as a missionary? So let's walk through this text this morning together. I have three truths for you. Here's the first one. Legacy living requires me to give up control of my life. That's hard. We all want to be in control, don't we? I mean, none of us would say we're control freaks, but we all want to be in control of our own life. I mean, some of you are saying, yes, I am a control freak, but I, I'm one too. We all want to be in control of our own lives. We all want to be in control of what happens, our own destiny. But here's what Jesus said in our text this morning. He said, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you don't carry your own cross and follow me. So what was Jesus saying here? Was he saying we have to hate our families? No. However, we have to realize that our lives belong to Jesus, and we have to give up control of our lives for the cause of Christ. Anyone that's ever been on a short-term mission trip, you know you have to be willing to give up control, right? If you've been on a short-term mission trip, things change rapidly when you serve in other contexts and other cultures. 
You'll be away from family. You'll eat different foods. You'll sleep in strange places. Participate in new customs. I've been on multiple short-term mission trips. I was a pastor in Southern California at the same church for 26 years. And we went, in those 26 years, went on dozens and dozens of mission trips. I led multiple mission trips myself. And you eat weird food, you sleep in strange places, you participate in different cultures, and you have to be willing to be away from your family for that time period. But you don't hate your family. You don't hate your family if you decide to move away from them or go on a short-term mission trip. It just means you're willing to give up control of your life, give up some of the conveniences that you experience for the sake of the gospel, for the cause of the Christ. Jesus was teaching here that legacy living will require us to give up control of our lives. Tammy and I have three children. Uh, our oldest and her husband, the one Darwin held when she was just a few days old. Our oldest, Sarah, and her husband, Mitchell, live in Southeast Asia with three of our grandkids. They're our missionaries. In fact, in the bulletin this morning, there was a blurb about ministry in Asia and Korea. In your cooperative programs, every time, cooperative program dollars, every time you give to this church, a portion of what you give goes to what's called the cooperative program that supports multiple things, including about 3,500 missionaries that we jointly support. When I say we, 47,000 Baptist churches jointly support them. Our daughter and son-in-law are, are, are two of those missionaries. They serve in Southeast Asia. They live in a country that's predominantly Muslim. They live in a country where it is illegal to proselytize. In fact, every citizen of their country has an ID card, and on their ID card it lists their religion. And there are six authorized religions in their country. Uh, uh, Christianity is one of them. It's an authorized religion, but the predominant religion is Islam in their country. And uh, it, it's illegal to proselytize. To, and it's very difficult to change from one religion to another. The work that my daughter and son-in-law are involved in, it's hard work. They have to sacrifice a great deal to live there. They've given up uh, all kinds of conveniences that we live with daily. They live thousands of miles away from family. Three of our grandchildren, three of our granddaughters now live thousands of miles away from us. We get to see them on FaceTime, and I'm grateful for that technology. So, does this mean that our daughter and our son hate their families? No. What it means is that they love Jesus more than they love the convenience of being close to family. That's what Jesus was talking about here. It means that they love serving God and they have a higher calling to point people to Jesus than they do to be near family. It means they love what God has called them to more than they love the conveniences that they have in America. They love Jesus and His call on their lives more than they love the convenience of living near family or anything else here. See, in many parts of the world, this scripture becomes very, very real. Because if you choose to follow Jesus in many parts of our world today, you'll be ostracized by family. In the country where our, our, our kids live, if someone comes to faith in Christ in that country, they will most likely be ostracized from their family, treated as if they're not family anymore. What Jesus was saying in our text this morning is you have to love me more than you love your family. For those of us that are Christ followers, our lives are not our own. And if you're not willing to give up control of your life for Jesus, he said you can't be my follower. You're an imposter, not a missionary. Paul, in a letter to the church of Ephesus, instructed believers there to make good use of their time. He said, use your time wisely to point others to Jesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. He says, look carefully then at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Now, most of us believe we're living in evil days. Paul says, make the best use of our time today. 
in, a, in order to point others to Jesus. Here's the second truth from our text this morning. Legacy living requires me to let go of my resources today and tomorrow. See, I'm truly a missionary for Christ when I let go of everything to follow Him. We give our resources to God through the local church today, and we plan for tomorrow through biblical estate planning. We're going to talk about that afterwards for those that are, that are going to stay. You bless your family and the kingdom simultaneously through estate planning. After the service, I'll explain how you can do that, how you can use your resources to bless your family and build the kingdom at the same time. My daughter and son-in-law who live in Southeast Asia, I told you there, there are our missionaries, there are Southern Baptist missionaries, and I'm impressed by my own kids, by what they've sacrificed. Several years ago when they moved overseas, they liquidated everything they own. They sold both of their vehicles, they sold our, all their furniture, they liquidated all of their earthly possessions besides what they could fit in four suitcases. They sold everything. They liquidated what they had and moved to another part of the world for the sake of the gospel. And every once in a while I begin to think, wow, they've really made a sacrifice. And then I read the scriptures and see that Jesus demands the same level and the same kind of sacrifice from every single one of us who claim to be followers of his. That's legacy living. Here's what Jesus said in our text. He said, but don't begin until you count the cost. Let me pause for a minute. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. There was a large crowd that was now following him. And he turned to the crowd and said, don't begin until you count the cost. What was he saying? He was saying, hey, if you don't know what you're getting yourself into, just turn back and go home because you're not going to, you're going to give up. He said, don't stay with me until you understand it's not going to cost you just a little bit. It's going to cost you everything. He was saying to the crowd, hey, don't follow until you realize it'll cost you everything. So he said, don't, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first getting estimates, then checking to see if there's enough money to pay the bills? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of funds. Then how everyone will laugh at you. They'll say there's a person who started that building, ran out of money before it was finished. You've all seen construction projects that have started somewhere through the project. It like goes radio silent. I mean, weeds begin to grow on the property. It just looks like they forgot about it. There's, a, there's a, a restaurant half built on a street near us. It's been, it's been half built for about 10 years. Weeds are growing up everywhere. We've also seen construction projects that have stalled like that. They didn't plan well. They didn't count the cost, as Jesus was saying here. But Jesus wasn't giving us construction guide, guidance here. Jesus was talking about serving Him. Jesus was saying that imposters, fake Christians, they hold everything really tight. And then they don't follow through because they can't let go of the resources. But authentic missionaries, those that practice legacy living, live with open hands. They live with a loose grip on everything God has entrusted to them. Jesus, when he talked about counting the cost, was specifically talking about the resources that he's entrusted to us. See, God knows your personal situation just as much as he knows mine. And he wants all of us to live with open hands for the sake of the gospel. Do something with me. Would you put your hands out in front of you? Open your hands just like this. And would you say out loud with me, God, everything I have is yours. Let's say it together. God, everything I have is yours. This is how God expects us to live. It's freeing to live with open hands. It's freeing to live in, in a way where, where, you, where you just live life saying, God, it's yours anyway. God, do whatever you want with it. This Holding everything really tight is exhausting. 
Holding everything really tight is stressful. Because when the economy gets crazy, it gets more stressful. And when gas prices skyrocket, it gets more stressful. But when we live with open hands, when we live knowing that everything we have, God's just entrusted to us for His purposes and His glory, it's free. It's work to hold things tight. But when you recognize everything you have belongs to God anyway, and you're just a manager of what He's entrusted to you for a handful of years while you're on this earth, it's freeing. It's freeing to say, God, it's yours anyway. God, use it how you want. God, do with what you've entrusted to me what you want to do. I've not always understood and lived this principle. Tammy and I were both raised in Christian homes. Both of our fathers were pastors. And we were taught from a very early age to give. I mean, okay, this dates me. My, my parents would give me my allowance or give me a dollar and they'd give it to me in coins so I would put a dime in the offering envelope and bring it to church on Sunday. I was taught at an early age to give. And Tammy and I, when we got married, decided we would be faithful from day one to give. But I've also lived holding my resources very tight. I've also lived with a tight grip on what God has entrusted to me. But in the past 10 or 15 years, God has been teaching me to live with a loose grip on what He's entrusted to me. And it's freeing. It's liberating. It's allowed Tammy and I to be a part of some pretty amazing things that God has done. It's allowed us to support people that have gone elsewhere in the world to take the cause of Christ to people who have never heard the name of Jesus. And it's freeing. And it's liberating. And it's amazing to be a part of God's work with the resources God has entrusted to us. Friends, it's God's stuff anyway. It all belongs to Him. So in this area, are you a missionary or an imposter? See, missionaries live with a loose grip on everything God has given them. But imposters live with a tight grip holding everything really close and tight. Jesus said this in Matthew 6. Jesus said, store your treasures in heaven where they'll never become moth-eaten or rusty and where they'll be safe from thieves. For wherever your treasure is, there your heart and thoughts will also be. So how do you store up treasures in heaven? By using your resources to get people to heaven. By using your resources to spread the gospel message to the ends of the earth. Here's the third truth. Legacy living requires me to passionately offer my skills, talents, and abilities to Jesus. And immediately when I say that, I know what some of you think because I think the same at times. We begin to think, well, I don't really have any talents, and I don't have any gifts, I don't have any abilities that Christ wants. I don't play an instrument. I don't sing. I, I don't like to speak in public. So I don't really have any gifts that God wants. Wrong. Every single follower of Jesus Christ is uniquely gifted, talented, and endowed with incredible gifts and abilities. In fact, our text this morning, Jesus discusses bringing our skills, talents, and abilities together to get the job done. He said in verse 31, Or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough to defeat the 20,000 soldiers who are marching, marching against him? In other words, do our 10,000 have all the gifts, talents, and abilities needed to work together to get the job done? Then he said, if he's not, then while the enemy is still far away, he'll send a delegation to discuss terms of peace. Again, Jesus isn't giving military instruction here. He's using an analogy to make sure we all are willing to bring our skills, talents, gifts, and abilities together here to the local church. You know, the local church is God's army. 
The local church is the army that God will use to accomplish His purposes here on this earth. Jesus established the church when He was here. And the church is the army He uses to accomplish His work. That's why Jesus said in verse 33, So no one can become my disciple without giving up everything for me. So what gifts do you possess? What abilities do you have? What talents are you good at? And then along with all the other members of the body of Christ in this church and the global church, we bring our gifts, talents, and abilities together. We combine them to get the work of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth done. Now, I've been on multiple, multiple mission trips. I've been, on med I've been on a medical team. I don't have any medical skills whatsoever. I I've been on multiple construction teams. Several years ago, I went to a Southeast Asia country where our kids live. It had been devastated by a massive earthquake. It destroyed thousands of homes. I led a team that went into this village and built 50 like 10 by 10 homes up off stilts so when the rainy season came, these people would have something to live in until they could rebuild their village. Rebuild their village. And I couldn't build a dog house that would stand on my own. I am terrible at construction. I'm just not good at that kind of thing. But, but I went on this team and I have other gifts and other talents that can be used. For instance, I can lead. I can organize. I'm a super detailed person, more than my wife appreciates at times. I'm detailed, I'm organized, I can do that. And so on these teams, I, on this medical team, I handled all the medication on this trip. They trusted me with all the meds, all these narcotics that we bought, like about $5,000 worth of narcotics or, or, or antibiotics and other narcotics that we bought here in the States. And we took to this country in Southeast Asia and, and I had a suitcase of them and there were other medical personnel that saw patients and just told me what to give them. I can organize pills. I can administrate that on our construction team. I help facilitate acquiring resources in country. It was super hard to get building supplies. It was incredibly difficult to get building supplies. So I navigated that with some local translators. When there was a couple conflicts on this building team about how we were going to build things, I navigated the conflicts between our construction experts and some of the local nationals that had a different view how things should be done. I navigated those I led so those with skills could get the job done. I handed nails to those gifted in construction. I fetched wood. I handed tools to them. They would mark a piece of wood and say, cut right there. I can do that. We use our gifts, talents, and abilities, and we all work together to accomplish God's purposes. And each of you has skills and talents and abilities that God wants you to use as His missionary here and abroad. I'm not to look at everyone else's gifts and compare myself to others. I'm me. God's uniquely gifted me. And God's uniquely gifted you. And it doesn't matter what gifts others have. What matters is the gifts that God has given you and whether you use those gifts to accomplish His purpose. That's legacy living. I'm to passionately offer my skills and my talents and my abilities to Jesus, and so are you. I love the way Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Paul said, Now all of you together are Christ's body. And each one of you is a separate and necessary part of that body. Every single one of you is necessary in the body of Christ. You're necessary for God's work to be accomplished right here at First Street Community Church. And you're necessary for God's work to be accomplished in our state, in North America, and even around the world. And when you give to the cooperative program, when you give to your local church, you support church plants 
all across North America. When you give to your local church, you support some 3,500 missionaries all across the globe who are sharing the gospel. It takes all of us to work together for the cause of Christ. That's legacy living. So are you living as a missionary or an imposter? Let me wrap this up. Let me make it super clear. What I'm challenging you to do today is three things. Number one, give up control of your life for the cause of Christ. Number two, let go of your resources for the cause of Christ. And number three, use your skills, talents, and abilities to serve Jesus for the advancement of the gospel in this community across North America and around the world. Jesus said, so no one can become my disciple without giving up everything for me. This morning, whether you've been a follower of Jesus Christ for 70 years or just a few years, God's calling you to legacy living, to give up everything for the cause of Christ. Whether you're a part of this church already or not a part of this church, this is a church that loves Jesus, that loves the gospel, and loves its community, and they would love to have you fellowshipping with them. I'm going to pray in a moment. And when I pray, I'm going to give you an opportunity to open your heart and life to Jesus Christ if you've never done so. And after I pray, we're going to have an opportunity for you to respond to what God is speaking to you this morning. So let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would speak to every single one of us this morning. Father, I pray right now you would draw our hearts to you. Father, I pray right now you would draw us to a point of decision. Father, where you would lead us to a deeper commitment to you. Maybe, Father, you would lead some here to unite with this church family this morning. Maybe, Father, you would lead others to recommit their lives to you. And Father, if there's someone here that's never put their faith and trust in you, this morning, draw their hearts to you. And Father, in this moment right now, have them seek forgiveness from you. And draw them to you. Father, I pray all this in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.